what is the difference between social security disability benefits and long-term disability benefits? And while these two types of benefits are similar, there's actually many differences between the two. First, social security disability benefits are paid by the government. Generally, in order to be eligible, one works a certain number of years and receives a certain number of work credits to receive these benefits. Long-term disability benefits, on the other hand, are paid by private insurance companies. Generally, these benefits are offered by an employer, and these benefits typically pay 60% of somebody's earnings before they became disabled. In Social Security disability benefits, the Social Security Administration makes a decision as to whether or not someone will receive benefits. When it comes to private disability benefits, a private insurance company and their doctors and their nurses are the ones that determine whether or not someone is entitled to these benefits. While these two benefits are similar, right, they're complementary to one another. What does that mean? When someone receives 60%, for example, of their prior earnings through private disability benefits, the insurer will offset or reduce whatever benefits the person is entitled to from the Social Security Administration. We have just seen the uproar about United Healthcare and the CEO being gone down because of the person who felt disaffected by the system. Well, there's another thing, and it's called group long-term disability insurance. Most people who have long-term disability insurance have group insurance through their workplace. So listen up, because this probably applies to you. There's an obvious puzzle before us. One in four people will become disabled during their prime earning years. A 25% claim rate is huge compared to other insurance policies like homeowner's insurance, which is 6% right now, except that's probably going up with all of the climate crisis activities <laughs> happening, if you could call it that, and auto collision, which is 4%. Yet a long-term disability claim is magnitudes more expensive than, say, repairing one's car bumper. So how the fuck do insurance companies stay in business? Well, logically, there are only three potential answers. A, they charge ultra-high premiums to make up the difference. B, they write the plan so that it's easy for them to deny claims and weasel out of paying up. And C, their business model is somehow subsidized by taxpayers. Well, guess what? To my shock, which it really wasn't because I was in the business, you know, it turns out the answer is usually D, all of the above. So now I will tell you why long-term disability insurance really sucks shit. Cassandra is the person I knew who went through the system. Cassandra reviewed her benefits package when she got a new job. When she saw she could sign up for something called long-term disability insurance for just a few bucks a month, her heart soared. She had just come back from several months of unpaid caregiving. It was emotionally grueling, physically exhausting, and financially devastating. She came home with this newfound appreciation for understanding what people go through. She had no savings, no body fat, and no hesitation about accepting the first job offer that came her way. Cassandra had seen firsthand how sudden and devastating disability could be. The concept of having, quote, disability insurance, unquote, well, it put her mind at ease. Cassandra thought it meant that if the same thing happened to her, she wouldn't have to worry about finances, and instead, she could focus on recovery. But that's not how any insurance plan worked. It's probably not how yours works either. Now, I'm going to explain it to you the way I wish anyone would have explained it to Cassandra at all, ever. Your paycheck will be cut in half. Most LTD plans only cover 60% of your income. Many cover as little as 40%. Obviously, some money is better than no money, but if Cassandra's earnings were cut in half, she sure as shit would lay awake at night, chest tight, wondering how long it would take until her accounts slowly drained into the negative. Or whatever you do get, you'll lose a, a fifth to taxes. 
Most plans are also what's called non-contributory. Quick! Do you know what that means without being told? (laughs) I wouldn't if I wasn't the HR person. Reading the fine print is a great thing to do, but the amount of research and education you need to actually digest that fine print is so unrealistic as to being unconscionable. Anyway, it means that your employer paid the premiums using pre-tax dollars. That means your disability checks are subject to income tax. For average folks, a tax rate of 22% means one-fifth of your money is gone. Poof! Gone! After two years, they'll boot you out and they'll tell you, get a job. There are differences between own occupation and any occupation policies. Own occupation asks if you can do your current actual job. For example, let's say a pilot gets diagnosed late in life with ADHD. There's one of several mental health conditions that the FAA will not allow in pilots for safety reasons. That pilot can no longer do their own occupation and they'd be getting, you know, long-term disability payouts instead for two years. After two years, the majority of own occupation policies switch to any occupation. So even if you can't do any job, the plan eventually runs out. But if you're lucky and your disability makes it completely impossible for you to do any work at all, your coverage doesn't last the rest of your life. It doesn't even last until retirement age, no matter what the policy says. Instead, most plans expire after five to 10 years. Many have abbreviated timelines for mental and nervous disorder maxing out at only two years. This is totally fair because as we all know, mental health disorders are a personal moral failure and definitely not the result of heritable traits, chemical imbalances, environmental hazards, and physical brain damage. Well, anyway, it doesn't seem fair. But it really is illegal under the more recent Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008. Well, I hope someone tells them that. You think HR will? Also, does your disability manifest some psychological symptoms like fatigue? If so, get ready for your insurance company to argue it's a mental health problem to weasel out of years of fair payments. Yes, they'll do this even if those symptoms have demonstrably physical root causes like dementia caused by nerve damage. Anyway, after that coverage period, your insurance company will send you a termination letter closing with something like, you know, we wish you luck in all your future endeavors. Pretty brutal. And no, you can't go out and get another policy because you now have a thoroughly documented pre-existing condition. Isn't this fun? They will probably deny your claim. As with short-term disability, the insurance company is the sole arbiter of your claim. Yes, even though they have an obvious conflict of interest because by denying your claim, they're saving themselves tens of thousands of dollars. Social security disability income denial rates are pretty high at one in three. Well, private insurers really don't want to tell us what their denial rates are. But would you be surprised to learn that we know that they can be twice as high, even more than that? If you don't like it, well, they'll meet you in federal court. Group plans are covered by something called ERISA, which is the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. Now, ERISA did a lot of great things to standardize employee benefits, but when it comes to these benefits, there are really wonky trade-offs that feel an awful lot like institutionalized ableism, as well as shocking violations of privacy and even due process. If you don't agree with the insurance company's finding, you must take them to federal court because you can't sue them in civil court, even though that's literally why civil courts exist. And you won't get a trial. Subscribers to ERISA-backed group disability plans will never, ever have a jury trial. Instead, a single judge will read the insurance policy company's records 
They issue a summary judgment. That means you cannot testify, enter new evidence, or cross-examine anyone to challenge their assertions. Your insurance company can legally stalk you to prepare a case against you. They can send private detectives to stake out your house, follow you, and secretly film you. If you muster the strength to take a single bag of trash outside, expect them to photograph you and doing it, you know, and use it as a pretext to say, see, they're faking it. You'll need a lawyer to navigate this process, and they don't come cheap. Most law offices that specialize in disability advocacy charge one-third of your lifetime disability earnings, or if you get a settlement, one-third of that. For those of you keeping track at home, yeah, if you used to make 500 a week, your insurance payout will give you 250. Taxes will take another 50. And if you miraculously win a summary judgment in your favor, favor your lawyer's going to eat another $65 and you're down to a quarter of your original income. That is why I say long-term disability is a scam. Most people who sign up for these plans would not do so if it was made manifestly clear in their name or the description provided by their benefits administrators that it is a partial, exclusionary, temporary, and deceptively piggybacked on completely separate ben uh, federal benefits programs to which you are entitled by virtue of your labor and your citizenship. Many, many people are being tricked into paying for something they already own. And that just makes me so mad. But I guess this means you think I shouldn't, you know, get long-term disability insurance. Well, as with short-term disability insurance, I can't tell you what's right for you. It could be that your workplace makes it free for you, in which, you know, why not, Right. It could be that the particulars of your group policy are better than what I've described. 99% of plans offset primary and family social security uh, disability benefits. Maybe the plan offered by your company is in the 1%. <laughs> For what it's worth, it seems that this is more commonly offered as a perk to hoity-toity executives. If that's you and you're somehow listening to this, please consider going away forever. I don't labor to provide free advice for people who feel deserving of special perks denied to others. Long-term disability insurance isn't completely useless. I'd still take it if it were free. And I'd still rather have long-term plan and a short-term plan. But doubtless, there are people who have materially benefited from their enrollment. But I will personally never spend a dime of my hard-won money on long-term disability insurance plan with terms such as these. Fuck that. In my view, the insurance industry, as it pertains to human life, not property, is a beast that has ravaged this country for far too long. The vicious self-advocacy of insurance industry is the primary reason why we don't have universal health care in America. And I'm sure they'd be thrilled if Social Security were shrunk, ended, bankrupted, or generally replaced with their private for-profit options. Just wait. But I can't tell you what's right to do for your life. You must do you. So there are a bunch of things you have to look at for a long-term disability program. Check your eligibility for Social Security. If your workplace offers long-term disability, read its terms or get somebody to help you understand it. Ask HR, because if they don't understand it, then they're worthless. How much is it costing you? What conditions does the plan cover? Does the plan treat mental health conditions differently? If it is, is it own occupation or any occupation or a blend? How many years does it extend? Is there a cap on monthly or lifetime payments? Will payments be subject to tax? Does the policy offset governmental benefits? Is there no better state run or individual plan available to you? Okay, now let's get back to Cassandra the person that I know about. She became disabled and was collecting her disability pay, and the insurance company even provided an attorney to help her with the Social Security process. That sounds great, right? Not. 
Once Cassandra was on Social Security and the insurance company recouped all they had paid to Cassandra by law from the back Social Security, which, as you know, or you may not know, Social Security takes sometimes up to two years to get approved. But then from the date that you applied, they will give you back the money that they owe you. So if the insurance company that you have your long-term disability with got you the lawyer, they'll take the money back. So they took the money back from, from her, okay? And then what happened was the insurer looked for every opportunity to kick her off. And they even offered her a buyout, but she declined at the time because she was disabled. Well, she never got a lawyer because she really didn't know any better. And she knew that she was disabled. She didn't think they had a case. But then she got a notice of termination of benefits. She had to hire a lawyer. She hired a disability lawyer, not a social security lawyer. And after the long, arduous demeaning process ensued, well, the details were awful. Cassandra essentially lost five years of benefits, even though the company could not deem that Cassandra was not disabled under their rules. But it didn't matter. If she didn't take the measly settlement they offered, she would have had to wait for a trial and could have most likely would have gotten a judge sympathetic to the insurance companies. Most are in the U.S. They're corrupt and they rule on the side of the big insurance businesses. So if you think Cassandra's story is sad, just wait. Americans are about to wake up to a whole new nightmare. Trust me.